Well, good morning and welcome to Grace. Would you stand and join us, please, as we sing together? You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you saved my soul. Good morning, Grace. If you guys would turn to your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 today. And we're going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 10. And the word of the Lord says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all lived, once lived in passions of our flesh, carrying out our desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the measurable riches of of the grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. 
It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. We just thank you for this day, Lord. Just uh, pray that you'd uh, be glorified in our worship, God. And we're so thankful that it's not of, of our own works that we're saved. It's through faith in you. God, and uh, we just uh, pray for Pastor Jamie as he brings the word today, just to speak through him, let it convict our hearts, and help us to apply it to our lives. I just say this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. above all names. Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God, to If you would please turn to Micah chapter 1. This morning we'll be in verses 8 through 16. Micah 1 verses 8 through 16. <clears throat> Just a few weeks ago I was getting ready to come to work and Pam was sitting at the kitchen table 
looking through her iPad, checking the news for the morning. I think I was getting some more coffee or something, and she just looked at me and she said, uh, did you see? There's another one. As soon as she said that, I knew exactly what she was talking about, that another high-profile pastor had fallen morally. He had been caught in a scandal. It's happened so much over the past few years that any time Pam says to me, hey, there's another one, or I say to her, hey, have you heard or seen there's another one, we know exactly what the other one is talking about. And I confess I should probably not read into the details of the fall uh, of these men, men and women, but I do. And, and all of the stories are different, and yet they're all the same. Here's what they all have in common. They're all very high profile, very successful pastors that all of a sudden, very quickly, have their sin exposed. Their fall is very fast, it's very public, and it's very shameful. The reasons for their fall is always one of three things that I was told by a pastor to always be uh, aware of. The downfall of the pastor is always one of the three G's, girls, gold, or glory. Uh, they either fall because of uh, infidelity, uh, because of some kind of money scandal, or simply because their pride got in the way and they quit listening to people and they became power hungry. And sometimes, many times, unfortunately, it's all three. And they all leave behind them a wake of frustration and anger and resentment and confusion by those whom they led as they step away from their ministries. And every time this happens, I look at this and I say, and I think this is the reason that I, I read the details of, of these stories, is I look at this and I say, this was avoidable. Okay, this didn't have to happen. That's not just high-profile pastors. I've seen it with other local pastors who I've known or or heard of personally, who served in churches. I've seen it with business leaders. Uh, you've seen it with people you've been connected with, friends or colleagues who everything seemed to be going well in their life. Many of them are the ones that are coming to your mind right now, also professing believers in Jesus you thought had a vibrant relationship with Christ and everything was going well, it looked like God was using them, and then all of a sudden some kind of sin is exposed that we find out has been there for a long time, uh, and they have this huge and fast Downfall. It is sad, it's frustrating, it's angry, angering, uh, and unfortunately it's a consistent problem. And when it happens, you almost feel as if a person died. There's a mourning that takes place. I mean, when you read about this, you almost feel like you've read about the death of a person and reading the stories of, or hearing the stories of how this happened, almost read like an obituary where all the details of what, what they were in their life and then how they came to their downfall. And so... As Christians, certainly when we see another Christian, whoever they may be, fall in this way, there's this mourning that takes place. Well, as we continue in the book of Micah, today we will see the mourning of the prophet himself as he prophesies over the impending judgment of Judah. Last week, the text focused on Samaria, at least it began to in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1, the northern kingdom. Today, Micah turns his attention toward the judgment to come of Judah, or the southern kingdom. I want you to listen as Micah describes his emotions and the depth of his emotions, and why he is so grieved as I read verses 8 through 16. If you'd please stand. Micah writes, For this I will lament and wail, I will go stripped and naked, I will make lamentations like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. In Bethlehem, Ephra, roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zanan do not come out. The lamentation of Bethizel shall take away shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Morasheth Gath. The houses of Akzib shall be de deceitful things to the, to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marishal. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald and cut your hair, cut off your hair. For the children of your delight, make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile." You may be seated. So Micah laments the coming destruction of the Lord and the judgment of God or the discipline of God on sin should cause us to mourn deeply over the destruction that we see, but it should also cause us to reflect carefully on the sin in our own lives. And I want to talk just very briefly about this word lament and what it means because it's not a word that's used often. It, the synonym essentially for it is mourning. We have an entire 
book of the Bible that is named after this word lament, lamentations. It was written by the prophet Jeremiah after Jeremiah, uh, and actually as he was watching the destruction of the southern kingdom in 586 B.C., he writes down, it's almost like his emotional journal, the Spirit has led him to write down, and he writes this book that we know now as Lamentations. It doesn't just mean mourning, but it carries a few other characteristics when found in the Bible. It's a deep mourning that goes beyond sadness to the point of really being distraught. It carries a sense of loss, most often permanent loss. Something that was meant to be is not going to happen. It conveys often a time of mourning. There's a time of lament. Sometimes it was a set time of mourning. And sometimes when somebody talks about lamenting, they talk about a season in their life where they just mourned over whatever loss they were experiencing. It's usually directed toward a very specific occurrence. And in the Bible, it's often associated with judgment and destruction because of sin. It's a very intense emotional mourning. So as we see in verse 8, this idea of mourning start, I want us to look at the great lament over coming judgment. The great lament over coming judgment that we see in verse 8. Micah has summarized the judgment to come to Samaria in verses 6 and 7. And thinking ahead to the judgment to come to Judah, Micah describes his lamentation in verse 8. He says, For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentations like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. Now, ostriches and jackals were known to inhabit what we call the boonies, okay, the wastelands. That's where they ran around. That's where you found them. Wherever there was nothing, you would find jackals and ostriches running around. And jackals and ostriches also make some of the strangest, loudest, and most eerie noises you will ever hear. There are barks and squeals and whines, grunts and moans. And Mike is so distressed that he compares himself to them while mourning was often uh, associated with the putting on of something, specifically sackcloth and ashes, as you may have heard in other places in the Bible. Micah is so distraught over the destruction or the coming destruction of Judah and what he sees coming that he decides to go out or, or links his morning to going out in the wasteland, taking off all of his clothes and running around making these eerie noises that you hear animal make, makes, that you hear his animal make. Now, there have been times... Uh, in my life, when I have mourned deeply, okay, I have cried or mourned or tears have flowed or even times when, when you just didn't know what emotion, where you almost kind of, kind of felt you didn't know how to express and words, whatever was happening in your life, words were never going to explain the depth of the mourning that took place. But I have never felt led to get in my car, drive to Hoosier National Forest, go out in the middle of it, take off all my clothes, run around and make animal noises. I've never been that distraught. And yet this is how Micah describes what's going on inside of him. This man is so upset beyond any real ability to communicate how he feels. And it reminds me just a little bit of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, 26, when in times of distress and weakness, Paul said, For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, Paul here in Romans 8 was not talking about specifically this type of mourning over judgment and sin. But there are times when we experience such deep sorrow and mourning that we don't know what to say. We don't know how to communicate. If somebody asks us, what is wrong? How are you feeling? There are no words to adequately express how we're feeling. And no matter how much we talk, we can't express it. And even at the end, sometimes we just decide we're not going to say anything at all. <clears throat> and this is what is happening to Micah as he thinks about this destruction that's coming to Jerusalem. This is where Micah is. His lament is beyond any ability to comprehend. But as we will soon see, this lament is not right, at least right now, over the specific sins of Judah. We will get into the specific sins of Judah in the coming weeks. But he looks at, the, he looks at the, what's going, going to happen because of the sin, the consequences. He looks at the nature of the sin, and that's what really causes him mourning. And what we'll see in verses 9 through 15 are multiple reasons for lament. There's multiple reasons for lament in verses 9 through 15. I want to give you four reasons for Micah's lament here, but before we do this, I want to read verses 9 through 15 again. I want to walk you through these 11 towns that are listed. Because what he does is he takes the names of these 11 towns and he uses them, kind of using them like puns, to describe the judgment to come to Jerusalem. So let me read verses 
9 through 15 again. For her wound is incurable, and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. In Bethlehem, roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shaphir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zayanan, Zayanan do not come out. The lamentation of Bethizel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for you, because disaster has come down from the Lord. To the gate of Jerusalem, harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. <clears throat> it was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Moresheth Gath. The houses of Akzib shall be deceitful things, shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marishah. The glory of the Lord shall come to Adullam. So these verses could be describing one of two events, and it really doesn't matter which one they're describing. It could be actually be a prophecy describing both events, but let me tell you what they are. One is it could be a prophecy describing what is going to happen some 100 plus years later in 586 when the, when the southern kingdom will finally fall and God will judge them with the Babylonians due to their sin. It could be pointing toward that. But there's another event that happened around 701, uh, 701 B.C., which was right around the time of Micah, not long after the southern kingdom fell, just over 20 years after the southern kingdom fell. It's described, if you want to jot this down, in 2 Kings 18 to 19. I'm not going to, to read that. But what happened was there was an attack on the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom almost fell then. It didn't quite fall, didn't quite go into captivity, but there was mass destruction. So it could be talking about either one of these things. Both of those were seen as, and, my, and, and we know, were the judgment of God on the southern kingdom due to their sin. Now let me tell you what God is saying through these cities and these names as he speaks through Micah. Gath. Gath, it says in verse 10, Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. This is referring to David's lament, King David's lament, at the death of Saul and Jonathan, which you see in 2 Samuel chapter 1. And 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20, this is an actual quote. As David is mourning, he says, Tell it not in Gath. So, the author Micah is going back to that time and saying the mourning that David experienced over the loss of his best friend Jonathan and his king, he, we should now be experiencing over this sin. beth le Ephra means house of dust. And he writes in verse 10, roll yourselves in the dust so Judah would be turned to dust. Shafir sounds like the word for beautiful. And in verse 11 it says, pass on your way, Shafir, in nakedness and shame. So he's contrasting beautiful with nakedness and shame. The beauty of Shafir would be stripped bare and shamed. Zayanon sounds like the word for come out. And he says in verse 11, the inhabitants of Zayanon do not come out. So the people were not to come out for battle. People would have been called to come out for battle. But Micah is saying the destruction is so great, you stand no chance of surviving this, that you might as well just stay in your houses. Bethizel means house of taking away. It says in verse 11, the lamentation of Bethizel shall take, take away from you its standing place. So the people of Judah would be taken down and taken away to captivity. Maroth, Maroth conveys bitterness. The people wait for bitterness to end and, and for good to come, but they will wait in vain. It says in verse 12, for the inhabitants of Maroth wait anxiously for good because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. But Micah is saying they can wait all they want. Nothing good is going to happen. They are going to be judged for their sin. Lachish sounds like the word for to the steeds, okay, which was usually a plea to fight. But here he's saying to the steeds to run, not to the horses to fight, to the horses to run. Verse 13, harness the steeds to the chariots and habits of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. These horses that were once used to fight these great battles now are needed to try to run from this destruction, which of course will be a hopeless cause. Morsheth Gath is associated with the word that means one who is betrothed. It says in verse 14, therefore you shall give parting gifts to Morsheth Gath, meaning that these kingdoms... Judah would now be handed over to these pagans, either the Assyria or, Bab or the Babylonians, as, a, as almost like a bride is given to her husband, and Judah herself would be given as a possession to these nations. Akzib sounds like the word for deceitful or deceptive. 
And verse 14 says, The houses of Aksib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. These kings who thought their kingdoms were safe are being deceived. They are not safe. Marishal sounds like the word for conqueror. And he says, I will bring again a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marishal. In other words, Judah is the one who will be conquered. They will not be the conqueror. And Adullam means the, recalls, Adullam is a city that recalls David's flight. He, he fled to the city when he's being pursued by Saul. And now Judah would flee. The glory of the Lord, verse 15, the glory of the Lord shall come to Adullam. So God's glory, which was once found and manifested in this nation, would now be fleeing, which was a shameful thought, the fact that the glory of the Lord fleeing from its resting place. So Micah used these 11 cities and he plays on these words and uses puns and literary devices to describe the depth of the destruction that's coming. Now with all that in mind, let me give you four reasons why he's lamenting using these cities and four reasons that we see in these cities and why there is lament. First of all, there's the incurable nature of sin. The incurable nature of sin. When something is, is incurable, it means there's nothing you can do about it. And somebody says, what you have, disease you have is incurable, means you're just going to have to live with it. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no medicine we can give you to cure it. You're always going to have this. And verse 9 says of Judah, her wound is incurable because Judah was a, was a stiff-necked nation in their sin. They had been warned over and over, but it was too late, and God would now judge. Their sin was too deep. There was no hope of them repenting. Now, sadly, we've probably all witnessed this at some point with another person, and sometimes we've probably done this to ourselves and experienced this to ourselves, where our sin and our stubbornness reach us to the point where we can say it is incurable. We know that God will gladly receive a person's repentance if they are genuinely repentant, but we also know by looking at the pattern or the history in their life and the number of times that they have been warned that we know they're probably just coming to a day where their wound is incurable. They, they refuse to repent. They have refused to repent. They're just going to have to face the consequences of their sin. And you've, we've all seen that happen to other people. There are many of us here today that could say, I've been in that position myself. I was warned over and over. I didn't heed the warnings. And so I had to face the consequences of my sin. And from the perspective of sin and just the entire biblical narrative of redemption that runs through, our, through the Bible... Our sin as mankind, as humanity, is incurable. There's nothing we can do about it. Due to our sin, our guilt is real, it is deep, and our judgment and our condemnation is sure. Sin is in us, it works in us to destroy us. James chapter 1 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth death. So at the end of the day, the only person you have to blame for your sinfulness is yourself. It doesn't matter what your context is, what kind of home you were raised in, what's happening in, this, in the situation of your life. If you weren't a sinner, you would not respond to that in sin. Okay, But because you are a sinner, because you are born unrighteous, because you are born bent towards selfishness and self and running away from God... All of these contexts, which are then put in your life, you respond with sin. But you do what you do because you're sinful. You're warped. You have nobody else to blame but yourself. You will be standing alone on Judgment Day. You will not be able to point fingers to anybody else about why you reacted the way you did. You and you alone have responsibility for your sin. So the only hope we have to escape is Jesus Christ. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, thought of the depth of his own sin and the incurable nature of of his sin and the hopelessness of being in sin, here's what he said in Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. He said, wretched man that I am. He had no hope. He said, who will deliver me from this body of death? Knowing there's nobody. He couldn't do it. Except in verse 25, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the only way. It's the only hope of being delivered from the incurable nature of sin. And this is one of the reasons that Micah laments. He looks at Israelites and he looks at Judah, and he looks at God's people, and he sees they've continued in stubbornness. They haven't turned their back. They've been warned. And he says their sin's incurable. They, they're just going to be judged. They've, they've reached that point. The second reason he laments is the devastating consequences of sin. Here's where Micah really uses the names of the towns I mentioned earlier to communicate the, the extensive nature of the judgment of God on Judah for their sin. They did not just suffer in one way for their sin. They suffered in multiple ways. I'll just summarize some of these again. He says they'll roll around in the dust 
of their once great nation. They'll need to stay in their homes because of fear. They won't even want to come out of their homes because of what's going on around them. They'll be taken away into captivity. They'll look for good, but they're only going to find bitterness. Horses that were once used in a, in a mighty army to conquer will now be used in fear to try to run and escape. The, the nation will be given to an enemy as a bride is given to her husband. They will be conquered. So this is why we always speak of the consequences, plural, the consequences of our sin, even if our sin is singular, and, the, and, and not the consequence of sin, because sin is never, uh, never comes with just one consequence. There's always multiple consequences. I heard years ago a pastor say, and I'm not sure who it is, and it's a pretty common quote among ministry, but it's true. It says, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost more than you ever wanted to pay. And so our sin... We think it's just going to impact this part of our life, but it doesn't. A sin, it has these tentacles and it reaches out into other parts of our life and it affects all areas of our life when we refuse to repent. And the longer we refuse to repent, the more tentacles it grows and, and, the, and the more difficult they are to remove from the areas of our life where we've experienced this sin. This is how Satan seeks to destroy us, as we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5. The sin area in your life has the ability, depending on what it is, to steal your joy, destroy your emotional stability, ruin your finances, do irreparable harm to your closest relationships, including and probably especially your family, wreck your physical health, bring a stronghold into your life that is not easily broken, and numerous other consequences. To think, well, this sin just has this consequence is naive. This sin, which you refuse to deal with, will grow, and it will get larger. And it will reach into other parts of your life, multiple parts, and it will destroy you. So Micah sees this in the people. He sees these, this, this, these multiple consequences of their sin. And that's another reason he laments that the nature and the depth of the suffering that the Jews will go through because of their sinfulness. Third, there's the shame that comes with the consequences of sin. A couple of these towns point to the shame that will accompany the judgment of God. In verse 11, for example, Micah tells the town of Shaphir, which if you remember sounds like the word beautiful. He says, pass on in nakedness and shame. This is a very raw and descriptive phrase. It's telling Judah that they would be like the one who is dressed and beautiful and the envy of many only to be paraded in public and stripped in front of everybody. In, everybody. in a very horrific and horrendous but relevant example during World War II, when the Jews were, uh, were horrifically persecuted by the Nazis, one of the ways that they shamed them was they would strip them completely naked and parade them, specifically and sometimes to their execution. All right, there's, there, there's, this, there's a shame that comes with nakedness, somebody stripping you down. Never forget, that's one of the ways we view and see Christ taking our shame on the cross. What happened before he was crucified? He was stripped. He was shamed. That's our shame. He's taking on himself. Then verse 15 says of Adullam, which recalls David's flight to this city when being pursued by Saul, that the glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Judah would now be the one to flee. This once great powerful nation, which was the resting place of the glory of God, would be put on the run, which was a truly shameful turn of events. And the Bible talks about shame that never leaves because of our sin. Proverbs 16, 30, 16, Proverbs 6.33 gives us an example. This is just one example, but it's a common one. But it can be used with multiple sins. And it's the shame of a man who commits adultery. It says he will get wounds and dishonor, and his dis disgrace or his shame will not be wiped away. Now this specifically is speaking about adultery, but it can be speaking about any sin where a person refuses to repent. Or just the idea of once you have sinned and once it becomes public knowledge, especially if you are caught in this sin and you don't bring it out yourself, that there's a shame that comes along with that. How many of you in here have a scar that goes back to a time when you did something stupid? Okay, there you go. So you got a, some people say, I've got a scar on my arm. Why? I had to have surgery. I broke my arm. Why? Well, I, college event, alcohol involved, don't want to talk about it. Okay. By the way, I'm not talking about myself. I have no scar on mine. I do have a scar right here that's a little bit more difficult to see because it's probably about 35 years old. Uh, but you can still pick it out, and it's a scar from a sissy test. Anybody know what a sissy test is? A sissy test was when you took a pencil and an eraser, 
and you had a buddy just work the eraser until you gave up. And you're like, and you gave up. And so I had a sissy test done, and I passed, okay? But I had to explain to my parents why I had this huge burn on my hand, which then scabbed up and turned ugly and could have gotten infected and all. And it's, I, I see it every now and then. I'm like, that's just stupid. That was just stupid, okay? So that's part of the consequences of sin. We, we sometimes have to relive our shame. You'll probably never see this, although you may want to now. Let me see your sissy test score. Um, let me show you mine, you'll say. Uh, but, but we have people say, what happened to that scar? Why, why did this happen? And as far back as, as far ago as maybe our sin was or our stupidity, you know what we'll have to do? Relive the shame. That doesn't mean we don't have forgiveness. It doesn't mean we don't have freedom in Christ. But it comes up every now and then. It's one of the consequences of sin. It never completely goes away. The final reason Micah laments over Judah's sin is perhaps the saddest, and that's this. And before I go on, I, I'm, I'm like feeling something here that I need to make clear before I move on since I'm being recorded and things go out there and people kind of misconstrue things. When I'm talking about the World War II and the, and the Jews, I, was, I am not saying that was a punishment on the Jews for anything. I was simply using that as an example as what it meant to shame people. Okay, What the Nazis did to the Jews was horrific and awful. And we should all be mourning that. So just to make that clear, sometimes you don't know what you have to make clear in, in when you're being recorded and people are hearing you. But I wanted to make sure that that's understood. Okay. Now, fourth, the unwillingness of God's people to heed warnings. All of this was avoidable. Whether Micah is talking about the near fall of Judah in 701 B.C. or whether he's talking about the eventual fall of Judah in 586 B.C., the reality is the same. Judah did not learn from the mistakes of Samaria. Despite the knowledge of God's judgment for Samaria for their sins, they eventually fell into the same sins. And they also faced the same judgment of God. Verse 13 says that in them was found the transgression of Israel. The same sin was their downfall. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 13 writes of the sins of God's people in the Old Testament. And he writes of the sins of God's people in the Old Testament to warn the New Testament people, his church, of the consequences of sin. So in verses 1 through 10, he talks about the honor and the privilege of the Jews being God's people. And yet, they fell into sin. Verses 6 through 10 describes four specific sins that they fell into. Idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God, and grumbling. All right. Then he writes in verses 11 and 12, he says, Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So Paul warns the Corinthians and us to not fall into the same sins that God's people did in the Old Testament to learn from their mistakes. Paul is writing to Corinthians and he says, you have these temptations and you have these sins. Look back at your forefathers, see what they did, see what they got wrong. Look at the consequences they they face don't fall in the same trap. And yet, it seems that we never learn. We see what the sin is, does to everybody else around us. We see the consequences it faces. You know, whether it's sexual morality, opening our mouth too much, you know, whatever it might be, we see what happens, and what do we still do? We do it. We still do it. When I was growing up, one of the things we did, there wasn't a lot to do, so we just ran around the fields and the woods and the marsh and the swamp, and, you know, me and a couple of friends would just run around and explore Every now and then, you'd come up on an electric fence. Well, somebody had to make sure that thing was on or off before we crossed. So somebody grabbed it, and it was on, and it lit them up, and you could see it. You know, and the rest of us are cracking up. That thing's on. We need to avoid that. But what happens? Oh, the, the rest of us have to grab it. You just have to. I mean, you've watched your friend grab it. You saw what it did to them. You saw the suffering they went through for grabbing the electric fence. The whole reason for getting them to grab the electric fence was so you wouldn't have to and you could avoid it. And what do you do? You grab the electric fence. You say, well, I never did that. Well, good for you. You learned. I didn't. Okay? I was usually the first guy anyway. You know? So what happens when you got friends that are bigger than you and can beat you up. They, you have to grab it first. <clears throat> but that's exactly what we do. We watch people grab the electric fence. We watch the suffering they go through because of it. We back up and we look and go, huh, I bet I can get away with that. And we try it just after watching them suffer. Well, this unwillingness to heed warnings 
makes just as much sense or is just as much nonsense, if you want to put it that way. We have countless examples from the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have biblical warnings that are given us. We have people that we know in our own lives. Uh, we have people that we've seen that we may not know, but we've seen their example, who have faced serious consequences over sin. And then what do we do? The same thing. We never learn. It's sad, and it's a good reason, as Micah sees, to lament. So the four reasons that Micah laments over sin and that we should lament over sin are this. The incurable nature of sin, the devastation of the consequences of sin, the shame that comes with the consequences of sin, and the unwillingness of God's people to heed warnings. And then in verse 16, Micah gives us a call to join in lament. Look at verse 16. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. At this point, Micah has described his lament and the reasons he's lamenting, and the question is not, why is he so distraught? The question really is, seeing the nature and the consequences of sin, why is everyone else not as distraught? That's the real question. We look at Micah in verse 8 and think, what is he doing? How can you be that upset? And the real question is, why are we not that upset? Shaving one's head was a sign of mourning. So Micah calls his readers to demonstrate their mourning and making themselves bald like an eagle looks, or probably in this context this word could also mean a vulture. Okay, The consequences of, that he has written about will impact, he says, their generations to come, the children that they like to watch and sit out on their porch and watch play with each other are going to face the consequences of their sin. And so he says... They're going to face consequences of your sin. You should be lamenting. You should be joining me in this lament. The call to lament biblically also comes with a call to repent. There's an opportunity to repent when Judah faced God's judgment in the book of Joel for their sin. Uh, by way of a locust plague, the prophet Joel called them to not just lament, but to fast and repent. Let me read to you from Joel chapter 1 and chapter 2. Joel writes, Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers at the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. With fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. In other words, sorry is not enough. Sorry is not enough. Just to lament over sin is not enough. Just to be sorry for what we've done, even deeply sorry, even sorrow to the point of tears over what we've done is not enough. There's always the call to repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 helps us define how we know godly sorrow from worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow, it says, brings death. In other words, it still brings the consequences of sin. Worldly sorrow does nothing. A person crying, shedding tears shows no that doesn't mean they've repented. Repentance comes with action. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says that godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. So if it's sorrow that's truly from God, it will lead to some type of change. Some type of, uh, of willingness and desire to change and move in a different direction. Which is why repentance can't be demonstrated or shown by tears. All right. I mean, there have been times when I've seen people cry deeply and repent, and they did change, and that's great. But for me, when I'm looking at people, I want to know, if you've, got a, if you've got a person who just cries tears over their sin, and then later they're doing the same thing, and you've got another person who maybe they're not as emotional about it, but they say, man, God's really convicted me about this sin, and four or five months later, they're a different person. Guess which one repented? Guess which one had godly sorrow? The tears and the wailing wasn't the key sign. The key sign was repentance. But there are times, certainly, when we're so convicted of our sin that we do cry. But it's cut short. It doesn't go the full uh, way it should go if it doesn't lead to repentance. God is not just interested in you having a good cry so you can feel better 
and go on. He's interested in you turning back toward him in repentance. Now, thankfully, we do not have to live in constant sorrow for our sin because of Christ. When we genuinely repent, when we're genuinely sorrow, God freely forgives for those of us who are in Jesus. First John 2, verses 1 and 2 says that we don't want to sin. Christ, true Christians don't want to sin, but when we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins and not just for our sins, for the whole world. So when conviction of sin comes and sorrow and repentance, then we can have joy immediately following because we know, yes, we are sorrow over sin. Yes, we have confessed it. Yes, we have repented of it. And Jesus, because our faith in him, freely forgives. It's not going to be held against us, which is why our sorrow can be turned to joy. <clears throat> but the tragedy is that the sin that we read about in Micah and all of your sin and all the sin that you see in the world goes back to one event. One event in Genesis 3 when Adam sinned and threw mankind in the position of being under the curse of incurable sin. We can do nothing about our sin and guilt. Only Christ can. Listen to Romans chapter 5, verses 17 to 21, a text I think we actually read last week during our scripture reading. Paul says, For if, because of one man's trespass, that's Adam, one man's sin, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ. One man brought sin into the world, only one man can take it out. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, Adam's sin, let one sin, one act of disobedience led to the condemnation of all men. All the sin you read about in the Old Testament and the New Testament, all the sin you see around you, all the sin in your life came from one man. So one act of righteousness, here he's talking about the crucifixion, the cross, one act of righteousness leads to the justification in life. For all men. One man brought into sin into the world, one act, only one act can take it out. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. In other words, the more laws there are and the more we see uh, that we're supposed to do, the more times we're going to sin and our sin just piles up and piles and piles up. So, so by the law came in to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So your sin piles up and piles up and piles up and piles up, and your condemnation before God piles up and piles up, and your reason and, and the justification for God condemning you and sending you to hell piles up and piles up to an incredibly great height that you cannot in any way overcome unless you trust in Christ who overcomes it and wipes it all away by his one act on the cross. That's it. He wipes it all away. One man led to all this sin. One man wipes it out if you put your faith in Christ. If you'd bow your heads. The first question here is have you put your faith in Christ? If not, your sins are piled up. Your continuing rejection of Christ himself is just piling up more condemnation on you and more of God's wrath on you for all eternity. There's nothing you can do about it. The harder you try, the more condemnation you build up for yourself because every time you try, you're calling God a liar because he's told you you can't earn your way and you're saying, yes, I can. I can keep trying. I'm good enough. And so all you're doing in every action in your entire life is piling up condemnation for yourself. It's like the drowner, the more they struggle, the more trouble they get in because they're getting tired and they can't do it. And the, and the harder they fight, the deeper they go. Until they quit struggling, realize they can't do it, and they trust the Savior who comes along and says, I'll take you. I'll wipe it all away. I've already paid for it. I took your shame. I took the, God's judgment on myself on the cross, the wrath of God meant for you for all these sins I paid for. All you have to do is trust it and believe I was raised from the dead and I'll change you into a new person, make you a follower of mine. It's that simple, but you have to quit fighting. You're only condemning yourself. 
And all it takes is just saying, okay, Jesus, I'm finished fighting. I'm done. I can't do this. I'm completely unrighteous. The more I try, the more unrighteous I get. I'm going to trust you. If you're here and you have put your faith in Christ, heed the warnings that Micah gives us. These were God's people, God's favored, God's blessed. And they were judged because of their sin. Now, we're not under condemnation as Christians, but we are under God's discipline. And I don't know about you, but some discipline can be pretty harsh. You don't want to face that. There are numerous people in this church, I'm sure, that if they could tell you the story, say, you do not want to face the, 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 the discipline of God in your life for ongoing unrepentant sin. It's shameful. It's hurtful. I still carry the scars. Even as one of God's children, they'll say, I still carry the scars. Don't do it. Learn from these people. Learn from these examples in Scripture. Learn from those around you. Father, we are grateful for the mercy and the grace of Jesus who covers all our sin. Help us not take that for granted. The mercy and the grace of Christ should embolden us to turn from our sin and run to him and not run from him. And so I pray that is what we will do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you stand and join us, please? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean.
All right, just a couple announcements today. Uh, church leadership team, we have a meeting after uh, Sunday school today, so head over to the fellowship hall after Sunday school for that. Uh, we got our Sunday evening service coming up at the end of the month on the 31st, and our chili cook-off. Um, there's uh, some of the rules there. It's got to be your own homemade chili, uh, no boxed or bag, and you can't purchase it from a restaurant. So uh, looking at you, Jamie, again. Um, uh, just see Kim Berryhill for information on that one. And, and fellas as well, uh, men, mark your calendars for uh, the 29th and 30th of January. Uh, we're going to be going to Highland Lakes Camp um, in the, for men's retreat. Uh, cost is $55 per person. Uh, that includes uh, three meals and one night board. And uh, please uh, pay that by the 27th. And uh, Mr. Paul Lindstrom will be leading us uh, through a Bible study on that. Uh, just see John Young or Eric Cantrell. Uh, for more info on that. And then uh, we have uh, small groups, like I said last week. Um, all the information is there in your bulletin. We got, we're got we hosting three. Uh, uh, one led by Eric Cantrell, doing life with your adult children. Uh, next one is Mike by Mike Roycraft, World Religion and the Gospel. And then uh, Pastor Jamie will be leading uh, dual, citizenship, excuse me, dual citizenship, the blessings, responsibilities, and dilemmas of being an American Christian. Uh, for those and all the information is in the foyer uh, for that and also don't forget to pick up your Christmas cards I think there's just like a couple left on the table out there as well and I'm gonna let Jamie uh, come up and tell you guys about the Wednesday night Bible studies <clears throat> so in addition to the Wednesday night Bible studies or the Sunday night Bible studies we also have a men's and women's study on Wednesday nights. They will begin, <clears throat> excuse me, on February the 10th. Uh, the Sunday night Bible studies do have caps on those classes. There's a limited number of people. You need to sign up separately on those. Th these are the Sunday night classes. The Wednesday night classes, the men's and ladies study, do not have a cap on the number of people. Uh, just to let you know that. There is a cost to the ladies class. It's $17. The cost to my class is $15 because there's material we need to get uh, ahead of time. And the deadline to sign up is January 31st. Pam will be teaching a study called Truth Filled, the practice of preaching to yourself through every season uh, based on the book of Colossians. And I will be leading a study called Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. Um, and uh, that's $15. And once we get the orders, we'll get your, uh, get your books to you. So sign up in the lobby. If you have any questions, you can talk to Pam or I on the Wednesday night uh, classrooms. These will go through um, probably the 1st of April. It, they're going to be 8 to 10 weeks. A lot depends on the weather in the winter time. Do we have to call a Wednesday night or cancel it? But a lot will be, uh, so a lot will depend on that. Um, but so look at this. And this is what we're doing for adults on Wednesday night. So we're not going to be having a prayer meeting for those weeks. If, you, if you're going to be here as an adult on Wednesday night, you need to sign up for the men's study and the women's study. But we do need you to sign up <clears throat> so that we can get you your material. So if you show up, that's fine, I guess, but you won't have the material. And, and you really need the material to be reading ahead of time because both of these will have some reading done <clears throat> ahead of time. If you have any questions about the Wednesday night classes, you can talk to me or Pam. You can also talk to Andy. <clears throat> well, I just want to, <clears throat> before we close, I'm going to close in prayer. Um, it's been kind of a slow news week. I don't know if you all have <clears throat> seen, watched the news, but not much going on. So I don't know if I have anything to speak to. Uh, I'm actually not going to say much. I'll just say this. <clears throat> One of the texts I always go back to when things are kind of happening around me and I'm not sure how to respond is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through uh, 12. One of the things that I constantly do <clears throat> is try to figure out what is my responsibility in any given situation as a Christian. Okay, and so I just want to read these texts to you because, it's, folks, it's not that hard. If you're serious about Jesus and you're serious about the Bible and you want to know what do you do, James tells us to ask for wisdom. God will give us wisdom, and the way he gives us wisdom is through his word. So let me read these scriptures, <clears throat> and I'll close in prayer. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning verse 9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now... You have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles 
Conduct is actions, attitudes, and words. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that then when they speak, when they speak of you or against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. <clears throat> if you'd stand, let's pray. Father, help us to always remember, first and foremost, our identity in Christ. That we are yours, you have called us, we are a chosen race, a holy people. Lord, a royal priesthood, your possession for your purpose. And that purpose is to declare the excellencies of Jesus Christ to the world around us. It is why we exist, it is why you have put us where you put us. You have called us to abstain from the behavior that we see a bunch of other people doing around us because we are exiles, we are sojourners. This is not our home. And to keep our eyes on our heavenly home and the great purpose. And when people speak evil against us, Father, we tolerate that and we accept it because we're not trying to win, Lord, people to ourselves or our viewpoints, we're trying to win them to you. One day they will glorify you voluntarily through their faith in Christ or on the day where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not always an easy balance. It's not always an easy proposition. Uh, Lord, but help us to do that in a way that honors you. You have promised to give us wisdom through your word. <clears throat> and so that is where we should turn. And that is where we need to turn in the moments that we don't know what to do, don't know how to act, don't know how to respond, don't know where to put our energy, our priorities, our finances, whatever it may be. Your word steers us in the right direction. And so before people know us as anything, let us be known as yours. Father, there is a lot going on in our culture. And so we pray for all of our leaders. Uh, we pray for all those who are put in harm's way to protect this incredible process uh, of a transfer of power that's not done really anywhere else in the world. And there's police officers and there are National Guard troops and, and people who are being called upon who are just trying to serve and do their job. And we pray for their protection. We pray for the wisdom of our leaders, that they would do what is selfless and what is right. And Lord, that you'd give them the courage to do that. From our congressmen and women, to our president, to our vice president, who by all intents and purposes is our brother. And so we pray for him especially, not just as a leader, but as best we can tell as a brother in Christ, as he has faced some difficult circumstances and days ahead. And Lord, that you protect him and his family uh, during all of this. Father, most of all, what we need as Christians is to keep our focus on you. Lord, the, the man Jesus Christ the Bible and the mission is what holds us together. It's what pulls us together. It's what keeps us together. So, Lord, let us commit together as a church to be examples to those around us, to deal with each other in forgiveness, love, patience, sometimes flexibility, to let each other just kind of have their space and differing opinions. Uh, Lord, but to recognize that we are family, and at the end of the day, we all agree that our first priority is to represent you and you alone. It is about people knowing and remembering the name of Jesus, and it is about his eternal kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.